Now, the second reason to bring in, bring in a gun ownership is to use it for an illustration, simply to point out that unfortunately, the sons of this world are shrewder than the children of light, as Jesus mentions in Luke 16, 8. In, the, in one respect, they are shrewder than we are. The worldlings do look to their resources. Right? They, they see something bad happening, and they say, what, what possible resources could I, I get? You know, guns and toilet paper. So you go out and you gather up whatever resources you think um, you might need. So they do look to their resources, and they make a point to stock up on whatever those resources are. They at least know that they're supposed to do something. And many Christians don't know that they're supposed to do something. Many Christians don't look at their resources. They don't anticipate the costs of spiritual warfare, and so they don't stock up on anything. Or they just go on the way they normally do, and maybe they do the same sort of thing that the um, non-believers do. So what I want to do is, is imitate the Apostle Paul in this. Oftentimes, the Apostle Paul will lay down a number of doctrinal issues in the first part of his letters, and then he'll give us a, a cluster of ethical exhortations at the end, sort of rapid-fire ethical exhortations at the end, and they all tie together. If you were paying attention the first part of his letters, they all tie together, but it sometimes seems like a, like a box full of uh, random uh, things. I'm going to do something very similar. If you're concerned about the spiritual state of our nation, you ought to be, all right? If you think that we're in a crisis mode, that is true, all right? We are in crisis mode. If that concern has affected you to the point of wanting to prepare yourself and wanting to prepare your family in order to protect your family spiritually, then you are thinking wisely. You are thinking as you ought to think. But what can you do? What kind of spiritual nine millimeter ammo can you stockpile, right? Uh, and if you go shopping for spiritual nine millimeter ammo, they're not out, all right? There are things that many Christians don't want to go buy they're, they're, that would involve too much thinking, but, they, but they're not out. They're not going to run low. What sorts of things should you concentrate on? We don't know what is going to happen in 2021. But I do know that if you start laying up the following things, and by this I mean dedicating yourself to them, to the pursuit of them, you will be far better prepared for whatever comes regardless of what comes. If you do these things, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Trump, Biden, economic prosperity, economic catastrophe. If you're doing these things, you're preparing yourself the way you ought to prepare yourself. So. I want to run through a collection of uh, exhortations that all tie together, but they might seem initially random. Number one, worship. Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve, and the word there should, could be rendered worship, whereby we may worship God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is the central thing. We assemble week after week. We want to worship God, and we want to do so reverently, and we want to do so with godly fear. There is such a thing as unacceptable worship, and there's such a thing as acceptable worship. We want to come into the presence of God and worship him acceptably. We don't want our offering rejected as Cain's was. We want our offering accepted the way Abel's was. Always the central thing is to worship God. Appear before him, assemble with your family before him every Lord's Day. Unless providentially hindered, unless, if the bone's sticking out, feel free to go to the ER and, instead of worship. But you need to be making a point. You, do, you need to be making a priority on worship. God summons us to appear before him to renew covenant every first day of the week. That's the day the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. And we are reminding ourselves and we're reminding the world that we are serving another king, the king, the Lord Jesus. And so consequently, worship is absolutely essential. It's the most important thing you do. It's the most important thing you do all week. Everything else that you do that has a great deal of importance should flow out of the fact that you've appeared before God and you have worshiped him. Think uh, every, every seven days, God gives you an opportunity to build something new. Every seven days, God gives you the, the opportunity to build something new. And every Lord's Day, he gives you the opportunity to pour the foundation for that thing you're gonna build. 
So every, the first day of the week, you pour the foundation, and then for six days after, you build on it. And then you get to do it again. And then you get to do it again. That's how the kingdom of God is, uh, takes shape in the world. We are called to worship the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, all over the world, God's people should gather and worship him. Number one, worship. Number two, honesty about sin. Honesty about sin. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, it says in Proverbs, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Be honest with God about what's going on in your head. Be honest with God about what's going on in your heart. Be honest with God about the things you may have hidden away and never actually done or those things that you've actually done. If you are not right with God, you're going to have real troubles in the course of all these larger and also very real troubles. So be brutally honest with yourself here. When we kneel before God at this worship service and we confess our sins, that's not just, a mo that's not just the motions we're going through. That's not, let's tick that box. Somebody read a book. Uh, somebody who put the liturgy together read a book and so we have to do that, you know, we're going to kneel before God. No, uh, kneel really. Confess your sins genuinely. Be honest with God truly. Be brutally honest with yourself. Imagine your heart, imagine your heart to be the living room where the Holy Spirit of God has come to dwell. And remember that the word holy is part of his name. Holy, he's the Holy Spirit of God. And that's how Christ dwells in you. When we say that Jesus is in your heart, when God comes into your heart to, to, to dwell with you and Christ is in you, he is in you by means of his spirit. His spirit has come to dwell in you. Picture your heart as the living room. And then imagine your thought life as you acting the part of a decorator. All right? The Holy Spirit's in the living room of your heart and you want to decorate it for him. And so you're walking around in the living room, hanging pictures on the wall for him to dwell with. And those pictures are your thoughts. Those pictures are your thoughts. And so you think, well, what the Holy Spirit must want is a little porn. What the Holy Spirit should want is a little envy. The Holy Spirit wants over here, above the buffet, let's, let's give him a picture of you snapping at the kids. Or the sidelong envious glance. Don't decorate your home like that. The Holy Spirit, you are the children of God, you're the holy saints, you're, you're God's people, don't decorate your house like that. Don't decorate your heart like that. Be, and, and when you find yourself, when you've slipped, when you've fallen, confess your sin, be honest with him and take the picture down. All right, Take it down and get on your knees, confess your sin, be honest with God about your sin. We're not going to be able to get... We're not going to be able to cry out to the Lord and ask him to deal with, oh Lord, deal with their sin. What their, their sin over there is doing bad things to our country while you leave our sin alone. No, reformation and revival starts with you. Reformation and revival starts at home. Judgment begins with the household of God, we're told. So, honesty about sin. Number three, marriage. Live joyfully, in Ecclesiastes it says, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. In other words, love your wife with holy abandon. Love her like you don't care what the egalitarians think. Love her like you don't care what the world says about marriage. They say, that what you're doing, that's kind of an impressive institution. <laughs> and you say, well, watch me go. I'm going to continue to love my wife with a holy abandon, and you need to do the same. And then wives, you need to return the honor and respect that the scripture lays out uh, to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the husband is the head of the wife. But remember, the head of the wife, if you're, if you're the head of your wife, that's not Mr. Bossy Pants. That's not, that's not Mr. Boss Man. The head of the wife, if you're, if you're the head of your wife, the way Christ is the head of the church, remember there's a crown of thorns involved. That's what headship looks like. All right? And you are, to, you are not supposed to be what the, the soft egalitarian world calls uh, a servant leader as though you... Uh, lead by serving, all right? You serve by leading, right? You don't, <laughs> you, we have it so backwards, we, have, we need to get these things straightened out. You are to serve your wife 
and you're to serve your family by being a man, by being a husband, growing a backbone. You need to be someone who serves your family by leading them, protecting them, guarding them, providing for them. Next, music. Psalm 22, 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the, pra- the praises of Israel. Our God, the God we worship, inhabits our praises. He inhabits our praises. All the psalms that we have are the arsenal and the hymnal of God. The psalms that we sing are, are songs that God wrote and gave, it, gave to us to sing, and he inhabits them as we offer them up to him. We are going into battle, and the battle requires a soundtrack. Make the Psalms the soundtrack of your warfare. This means learning them. Get the app. Join the choir. The Psalms will be the vocabulary of the real resistance. In over 2,000 years of church history, the Psalms have been the vocabulary of the church's resistance to every form of tyranny. They're God's songbook, and everything is addressed in the Psalter. You're going to find yourself singing things. Uh, If you've got a pop evangelical background and you start learning the Psalms, you're going to find yourself singing things you never sang before in your life. And you're going to realize in hard times how fitting these psalms are. So, you might say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not all that musical. I can't carry a tune with a forklift. Well, uh, they wouldn't let me in the choir. Yes, but you need to try at least three times. <laughs> you, need, you need to give yourself, you might say, I'm not that musical. Well, the church is musical. The church needs to understand that music is an essential part of what we're doing. It's not an add-on extra. Music is part of, an essential part of the resistance. Next, hospitality and community. Hospitality and community. Not only do we live in disordered and confused times, we live in fragmented times. We live in times when a lot of people um, eat all their dinners over the sink. And they're on their, on their, just came in or on their way out. In, In Romans 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. Notice the fact, notice how the fact of tribulation does not negate the need for hospitality. He says earlier, patient in tribulation, patient in tribulation, and then in the next breath, he says given to hospitality. You might say, well, if I'm in the middle of a tribulation, why would I have people over? Well, there's a difference between hospitality and entertaining. Entertaining is fine, but we're talking about hospitality. There's nothing, entertaining is not a sin, but it is a sin to substitute entertaining for hospitality. Notice how this tribulation doesn't negate the need for it. It's an ongoing tribulation. It's the kind of tribulation that requires the, the apostle to say, you need to be patient, patient in tribulation. And in this context, we still need to be given to hospitality. There will be a temptation to hole up, and it's a temptation. There will be a temptation in hard times. It's a temptation to just run to ground, hole up, and say, okay, I'm going to wait till it, I'm going to hunker down and wait till it's all over. It's a temptation. When preppers become loners, the problem is that they're not prepping in any way that really matters. You prep by being knit together with your people. You prep by loving one another. You don't prep by becoming a hermit. So, you need to be a closely knit people, and that means that you all need to know what the inside of one another's homes look like. You need to be knit together, you need to be close, you need to be inviting people over, you need to be, go, be going when you're invited, be given to hospitality, and be given to hospitality in the midst of a tribulation that you have to be patient in. Next, Christian education. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring your children up in the paideia of the Lord. This is a critical component in what we've been up to here for decades now. It was the neglect of this that has been one of the driving engines of our culture's current travails. Whenever you see a grown-up holding up a placard with some nonsense on it, you know, the free chocolate milk for everybody kind of thing, know that it is pretty likely that he graduated from some godforsaken institution. 
right? All those people who are wrecking everything were educated somewhere. And, and what will it matter? I mean, what does it matter? It, it's one school's the same, the same as another. And we're discovering all of a sudden to our dismay that it matters quite a bit. It matters quite a bit. You can't bring up a generation in a godless way and not be confronted at the end with a godless generation. You can't plant morning glory and then harvest barley. It doesn't work that way. We have been planting godlessness in our educational system for a long time and the crop is coming in and we don't like the crop. So Christian education, redouble, triple your efforts to, to focus on Christian education. The next, um, and, and all, each one of these could be its own um, message, right? Debt free, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7. Your central encumbrance, as Paul says in Romans 13, owe no man anything except the debt of love. Your central encumbrance should be the encumbrance of love. Do not take this as the counsels of perfectionism, as though we got Dave Ramsey and injected him with steroids and, and said, okay, uh, I'm not talking that way. But I, don't take it as the counsels of perfectionism, but you should be seeking to minimize the handles that others might grab in order to steer or manipulate you. You need to, you need to be thinking practically what sorts of pinch points might be brought to bear on, on me and on my household. And one of the things that you should want to do is to get as free of those sorts of encumbrances as you can. Uh, obviously, a lot that needs to be unpacked there. Next, joviality, cheerfulness, and laughter. Then he said in Nehemiah 8.10, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now in Nehemiah, they had a lot of work to do. They had a lot of enemies. They had a lot of enemies outside the city. They had a lot, to, a lot of work to do on the walls. Everything was in disarray. Nehemiah was up against it worse than we are. Let's put it that. Nehemiah was up against it worse than we are. And he told them, eat the fat, drink the sweet, rejoice. Why? Why should you rejoice? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Remember, Paul says that our weapons, our non-carnal weapons, are mighty. The thing that's mighty in this is joy. Our weapons are not carnal, but being joyful are mighty. We are to fight, but not like thugs and churls. We are to fight. But know that, that if this is the case, it is a fight we were born for. If we are called to fight, if God has assigned this fight to us, then we were born for this fight. So stop feeling sorry for your grandchildren. Oh, look at the mess of a world we're giving them. Yeah, uh, uh, that might be good for a joke. Sorry about that, kids. But stop feeling sorry for them. Why would we... Why would we bring up a generation of dragon fighters and then wish for no dragons? Doesn't make sense. You, if, you, if, if you believe the word of God and if you have been giving your, your kids and your grandkids a Christian education, then this is what it's for. So yes, this is a version of cheer up. It's far more dangerous than you think. <laughs> yes, it is. So cheer up. Family dinners, Sabbath. Sabbath. Family dinners, Sabbath. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Deuteronomy 6, 7. Church is where your instruction is packed for you. Church is where your instruction is packed for you. The family table is where it is unpacked. Right? We pack things. We pack things for you. We bundle them up. We give them to you. At the family table, unpack them. Talk about them. Pick them up. Look at the other side. Engage with one another. We pack them. You unpack them. Make sure you dedicate the necessary time for the unpacking. Sit down and eat together as families. And then remember hospitality. Have other people over as you do it. Next, study. Read. Study to show yourself approved. It's, uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. First, read the word. If you have a Bible reading regimen that is more rigorous than the Bible reading challenge, then please carry on. If you're, have at it. 
Uh, God bless you. But if you're the kind of Christian whose Bible reading is limited to a plaque of the 23rd Psalm that you have in your entryway, then dust off your Bible and get with the program. We need to be Bible readers. We need to be taking it in. We need to be taking it in like nobody's business. One preacher famously said, may have been Spurgeon, there's enough dust on some Christians' Bibles to write damnation with your finger. Whoa. <laughs> they preached differently in the 19th century. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and things weren't chaotic. Well, no, well, they... Second, read a book. Read, be in the word, be steeped in the word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But also, read a book. Get informed, stay informed. Read books, which is far better for your emotional equilibrium than chasing rumors on the internet. Okay, read a book, study. Give yourself to a disciplined pursuit of understanding what is going on. Then work. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Paul's illustration there is the foundation is Christ Jesus, and some people build wood, hay, and stubble on it and burns up in the day of fire. Others build with costly stones and that sort of thing. And he's talking in context, he's talking about the work of ministry, but it's a principle that all the people of God can imitate from their ministers. Dedicate yourself to things that matter, doing things that matter, and let your metric for this be the scriptures and not the soft feminism of contemporary evangelicalism. Work on things that matter and let the Bible be the thing that tells you what matters and what doesn't. Then stories, stories. Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation, Joel 1.3. Now, Joel here is talking about a cautionary tale. Joel is saying, this was a really bad thing. This was a terrible calamity that happened. It was a, it was a horrible tribulation with raisins in it, right? And, and Joel is saying, tell your kids about it. Tell, make sure that this word gets passed down. But it's not just cautionary tales. It's great inspirational tales as well. All the stories. Tell all the stories. And while you're at it, Live out some stories that will be worth the telling. Live like someone that someone might want to talk about later. Give something to your children so that they can have something to pass on to their children. And no, please know that there's far more than this. The world is a big place. But there's certainly not less than this. This, this is a starting point. And the first item, worship of God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit is the box that will hold all these bullets together. It is the safe where you keep them. But you don't just keep them hidden away. These are gathered up to be used. These are gathered up so that you might know what to do when the time comes where you have to do, choose and do something.